Well, hello everyone. This, my name is Donna Hicks and I'm the chair of the Herbert C. Kelman Seminar. And I just like to welcome you and thank you all. I know there are people uh, registered from all over the world and we're really grateful uh, that you decided to spend this time with us um, giving, paying homage to our beloved Professor Herbert uh, C. Kelman. And just so you know that this, this seminar is co-sponsored by the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs at Harvard and the Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law School. And as I said, today's seminar is a tribute, is a tribute to, um, to Professor Kelman. And there was an in-person memorial um, back uh, just on September 16th, but we thought we'd like to give other people all over the world and who weren't able to come in person and see it, um, the opportunity to just uh, reflect on his work, to reflect on his contributions. And, um, and if you'd like to make comments uh, or ask a question about Herb, um, please put your uh, comments or questions in the Q&A function because we won't be checking chat. So just pop it in the Q&A if there's a question that you'd like to, to ask or a comment that you'd like to make. And, you know, as many of you know, probably all of you know what a, what a, a profound commitment to peace uh, in, in the world uh, that uh, Professor Kelman was, was committed to. And he, you know, he did so much work in the Middle East and, um, and, and, and through his students, people like me, we did these workshops that I'm going to talk about all over, all over the world. So he's made a major contribution. And each, there are only three, three of us presenting today. I will start and I'm gonna be talking about the interactive problem solving workshops that he created and specialized in. And then we'll have Dan Shapiro um, talking about the uh, influence model that Herb developed and then Jeff Sewell will be um, discussing the innovative aspects of Herb's work. Um, so again, I want you to uh, remember to put your comments and questions in the Q&A. And this session will be recorded. So if um, any of you would like to see it again or give it to some of your friends, what you could do is go on the PON website in about a week and we'll have it posted there. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, as I said, start out, as you know, many of you know, I was the deputy director of the program on international conflict analysis and resolution that Herb uh, and his students uh, started. And uh, I've been doing work with Herb for the you know, past two decades, close to three in some cases. And um, I'm, just, uh, I'm just so happy to be able to talk a little bit about um, Herb's contributions of the interactive problem solving methodology for trying to bring warring parties together for dialogue. But before I start, I would like to um, just introduce Dan Shapiro and, and Jeff Sewell. Dan uh, is the founder and director of the Harvard International Negotiation Pro Program. Is a, he's an associate professor of psychology at Harvard Medical School, McLean Hospital, and an affiliate faculty at the Program on Negotiation at the Law School. He's author of Negotiating the Non-Negotiable, How to Resolve Your Most Emotionally Charged Conflicts, and co-author of Beyond Reason, Using Emotions as You Negotiate. Dan teaches conflict resolution at Harvard College, instructs psychology interns at the Harvard Medical School, McLean Hospital, and leads executive education uh, sessions at the program uh, on negotiation at the law school, the law school, the Kennedy School, and the Harvard Medical School. He served on the faculty at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy um, and the Sloan School of Management at MIT. And he's launched successful conflict resolution initiatives in the, in the Middle East, Europe, East Asia, and for three years chaired the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Conflict Resolution, focusing extensively on the emotional um, and identity-based dimensions of conflict resolution. Um, the, and so Jeff Sewell is gonna be our next speaker um, after he'll, he'll close things out for us uh, today. He is uh, a lecturer on the 
a practice of peace at Harvard Divinity School. He also serves as a co-chair of the Peace Appeal Foundation and as a partner in the international law firm Holland and Knight. The Peace Appeal Foundation, which was founded with a mandate from five Nobel Peace Laureates, including Nelson Mandela, Desmond Tutu, F.D. de Klerk, is an international NGO that helps local stakeholders launch and sustain broad scale peace and national dialogue processes to end or avoid war. Jeff earned his MTS at Harvard Divinity School and LLM in international law at Harvard Law School. After great graduating from the Divinity School, he taught negotiation and conflict resolution courses for several years at the law school, where he developed Harvard's first course, course on complex multi-party negotiations. He was also a senior associate of the program on international conflict analysis and resolution at the Weatherhead Center uh, with Herb and me. Sewell's scholarship is focused on conflict with a religious dimension, large scale peace and national dialogue processes and negotiated resolution of disputes involving deeply held values, both religious and secular. His current writing projects projects include a book, in, book entitled Negotiating Across Worldviews, Resolving Moral Conflicts Without Selling Out. So there, as I said, um, they're going to be coming up uh, and talking. Um, uh, I, I'm going to be starting here um, with uh, an introduction for you to the remarkable work that Herbert Kelman uh, developed in order to, as I said, bring parties together for, um, for dialogues. He, he created the, uh, what this track to uh, unofficial diplomatic effort um, in order to address what he felt were some of the core drivers to the conflict. Yes, there were, you know, political issues, power issues, resource issues that were driving the conflict, but as a social psychologist, he firmly believed that there was a significant social psychological dimension to these conflicts and without addressing them, he felt that there would never be an enduring peace or an enduring end to the conflict. So his contribution was um, by viewing the problem in the con by viewing the conflict as a problem in their relationship between the parties. And what one of the unique features of his approach, what's called which is called the interactive problem solving method, is to have the parties themselves jointly come up with solutions to those relationship problems. And of course, the, the problems were, were described and uh, articulated by the parties themselves. So they were the ones who, who steered the conversation and were able to, um, were able to describe in this process, the interactive problem solving process, the fundamental human needs that were at stake that were being unfulfilled by the conflict. And again, this was the social psychological contribution and Herb got his inspiration from John Burton, who was an Australian diplomat who first came up with this notion that, you know, we need to look at these deep underlying human issues before we can think about any, uh, any permanent resolution to these conflicts. So that core psychological uh, issue that, that was at the foundation of his interactive problem solving methodology was dis, d, trying to find a way to jointly come up with ways to address everyone's needs, fears, and concerns regarding the conflict. And the way John Burton originally thought about the human needs and Herb picked up on that was by thinking that everyone has a need for identity, recognition, autonomy, security, and uh, also a sense of justice. So Herb's methodology was to bring people together and to sit down to talk about those needs, to have one side articulate what, that, what those needs and fears were, and the other side would sit at the table quietly, listening very carefully. So the whole, the whole idea of focusing on these 
unmet human needs really was, and I'm sure Jeff is gonna say that this was an innovation. So it certainly was an innovation in international conflict resolution because the predominant realist theory was, you know, address the power issues and the resource issues and, you know, see if the politics, we could get the politics in some way to be compromised and have the issues resolved that way. So Herb's, I think all of us who were trained under him would say that giving people an opportunity to really talk about what these deep human um, assaults to their, you know, to their sense of identity, security, all of these things, it was just so powerful to sit there and, and be a witness to that as a third party. And the other thing is that um, Herb really believed that there was a need for mutual recognition and responsiveness to on both sides that if it, it wasn't good enough if one side just recognized you know the other but there had to be this jointly arrived at mutual recognition and the other word he used all the time was responsiveness we need to be responsive he would say to the needs and the fears and the concerns of, of both parties so let me just tell you technically a little, one aspect of the ground rules, which I think was, were so interesting. Of course, confidentiality was the first ground rule in this process. And he was so afraid that par parties would be exposed when they go back home and you know, they might be, they might be you know, threatened knowing they met with the other side. So confidentially, uh, confidentiality was number one. The other thing was, um, they wanted to be sure that there was no attribution of any one idea to any person. So that's, that was a non-attribution cause. And they, I heard also said, well, listen, we need to speak to understand, speak to be understood and to listen to understand. And I, I just thought that was really, I remember hearing him say that for the first time, how do we speak to be understood instead of getting defensive and trying to convince other people we wanna speak to be understood. And the people, as I said, when they, uh, both sides were discussing their basic needs, fears and concerns that had to be addressed for them, the other side sat quietly and, um, and really did take in what they were hearing uh, from the other side. And so the first step was identifying the problem by describing what the needs were. And so each, each party would get a, a turn uh, to, to list their needs and fear, and we would write them down on a, on a whiteboard um, so that they were present in the room for everyone to see. And then the second step was to figure out how to respond to and, to and fulfill these needs. So the discussion focused on how, what is it gonna look like to fulfill these needs? And then most importantly, he had a session where we had to look at what the constraints were to what they came up with. You know, it's nice to just brainstorm ideas about how to fulfill each other's needs, but what are the constraints? And the next step was overcoming those constraints and the third and uh, the final step was how do we how do we um, get this these new ideas injected into the official process? Because the people that people who her invited, they were um, unofficial um, unofficial participants. They had influence. They had tremendous influence in in the in the in the conflict and in the, their communities. And so he wanted to be sure that the people who he brought to have these discussions could feed these ideas into the political process. And uh, he, yeah, he called them political influentials. And uh, finally, um, I'll just end by saying that um, it really was something to see um, her create this, this dialogue process and to make sure that the relationship was being addressed in this, um, in the conflict and not just the political issues, but the basic human needs. And it moved us all, it really moved us all. And in the end, he would always say to us, those of us who were working with him as a third party, he would always say, we wanna create a sense of hope and possibility for the, for the parties. And I, I just remember feeling, yeah, he was the repository of hope. 
for the people and then the repository of trust as well. So um, I think I'll end there and um, let Dan Shapiro take over. Thank you, Donna. Um, I, I must say I've learned so much from Herb and from you over the years and, and I've seen the two of you and how brilliantly you work together, thought together and help make the world a better place through all of it all. I feel really honored to be here today with all of you and, and I see in the chat from, we can say with confidence from around the world to pay tribute to, in my life, one of the most important mentors um, I had, Professor Kalman. Uh, he was a scholar of great character, great vision, and his work has had an impact not only on my own scholarship, but on the field of conflict resolution, and as Donna was noting, on the world more broadly. What I'd like to focus on today is what drove his philosophy of conflict resolution? What drove him to develop interactive problem-solving workshops and these other innovations that Jeff will be talking about to me, Herb was interested in change, real change, deep change. And I could sense that from the first time I met him some 30 years ago. And I, I alluded to pieces of this in his memorial, but I was an undergraduate at Johns Hopkins University. My mentor, Dr. Jerome Frank, he'd worked with Herb years earlier at Johns Hopkins. And Dr. Frank had encouraged me to meet with Professor Kelman, and we did meet in Herb's office on the 14th floor of William James Hall at Harvard. And our 30 minute Thursday afternoon conversation turned into a three hour conversation. And Herb shared with me in vivid detail his experiences growing up in the shadows of World War II. He told me how he was born in Vienna and grew up in a Jewish home, how when he was 11, Austria came under Nazi rule, how his family was kicked out of their apartment, his sister and he kicked out of school, placed in a Jewish gymnasium. He told me how it was unsafe to walk to school and how his father's store had to shut down and how his father ran the constant risk of being dragged into a concentration camp. He told me his family knew they had to leave to survive. So here I am, you know, a young, young scholar listening to all of this, and these stories left an indelible imprint in my mind. And I became intrigued to understand more about what Herb saw as the essential factors driving conflict, driving war, and driving peace. The biggest hint I felt was that I noticed he often referred back to an article that he wrote way back in 1958 in the Journal of Conflict Resolution. In fact, he published a longer version of it a few years earlier. I always felt this article had a special meaning for him. The article examines processes of social influence. It's now a classic in the field of psychology. I looked today on Google, it's been cited some 6,024 times as of today, which is remarkable. And the academic quarters, the article is called Compliance identification and internalization, three processes of attitude change. And in it, he tells us that it is not enough to know that there has been a measurable change in attitude. We also need to know what kind of change it is. Is the resolution to a conflict but a superficial change that disappears quickly? Or is it a more lasting change in attitude and belief? And this matters greatly, Herb argued, in the field of peacemaking, both in terms of understanding why people commit heinous acts of violence during war times and, and what it takes to move people to sustainable peace. So he proposed three levels of possible change in attitudes and actions. Again, compliance, identification, internalization. Let me offer a mundane example just to bring these concepts to life and then I'll connect it back to peacemaking. I have three boys in my house here and the middle one, Zachary, he's now 14 years old. He loves gaming on his computer and he would be delighted to play his games all day, all night to sit there on that machine. How can I, his father, get him to change his behavior? Herb's theory would say one way is through compliance. I ask Zachary, stop playing your game. 
And if you do, you will have the good grace of your parents. And if you don't, I'm going to take your plug. It's the plug to the computer. It's reward. It's punishment. And it's external. Her second approach to social change was identification, or social processes to change was identification. Here are the ideas I would say to my son, Zachary, look, all of your friends are gaming for no more than one hour a day. You want to be like your friends. You identify with them for sake of the connection you feel and that relationship to your friends. What do you think about one hour a day? And Zachary says, well, maybe. That's identification. But it's still outside the self, largely. It's about the relationship, but not the self, the internalized identity. And so Herb conceptualized this third process of change, and he called it internalization. Here there is intrinsic reward. So I sit down with my son, Zachary, and I say, look, what kinds of values do you want to live by? Do you want to be the kind of person who's gaming all day, all night? Let's think of some other things you can do some afternoons to help the community, to help around the house. And he then acts on behalf of his own internalized values, not in reaction to dad's demand. Herb was interested in real change, in deep change. I always felt he knew that the proposition of never again, of never again having any sort of mass violence or systematic mass murder like the Holocaust, he knew that prevention of those situations requires deep change. Compliance is important, he noted. Identification is useful, but sustainable peace will only come about, he argued, if disputants internalize a new way of being in relation to former adversaries. And Herb moved the entire academic conversation in the direction of recognizing the importance of identity in conflict resolution. He went on to connect these three social processes to three approaches to peacemaking. He said that in conflict settlement, we work to satisfy parties' interests. This is not necessarily stable in the long term, but people are complying. Attitudes, identities, they'll remain potentially in opposition. He then said conflict resolution. In conflict resolution, we change the nature of our relationship with the other side. We become pragmatic partners working side by side together to promote coexistence. But he wrote some very, very profound articles then on reconciliation, ultimately arguing that reconciliation is the heart of sustainable change, that we internalize a new relationship based on our values, based on our beliefs. He called this process negotiating identity. And as Herb put it, and I quote him now, he said, the primary feature of the identity change constituting rec reconciliation is the removal of the negation of the other as a central component of one's own identity. To me, this was a genius insight. Parties can and must maintain their own identity. I, don't, I can't change my core beliefs and values, but I can change the way I see my relationship to the other side. I can change the nature of those internalized values of that relationship, internalize a new mode of relating relegating negation of the other to what he would say is at the periphery of the identity. That is deep change. That is real change. And I believe Herb was prophetic in seeing that this is precisely what we have needed and what we need in our world today as much as ever. Thank you. Great. Well, gosh, it was uh, lovely to hear Donna and Dan speak about uh, Herb and uh, go deep on a couple specific topics. What I want to do is talk about Herb as an innovator generally. Uh, and as I start, I, I have to say up front, I know I won't do this topic justice, but, uh, but let me try to give you a sense of, of Herb as an innovator. Many of us who spoke at the memorial that Donna mentioned uh, quite justifiably use words like pioneer or trailblazer for Herb. Uh, 
he, he certainly was a pioneer. He was one of the small number of founders of the fields of conflict resolution and peace studies. Um, but I want to say up front that I think there are some paradoxes that emerge as we look at Herb and his work through the lens of innovation. Uh, I'll note just a couple. Um, Donna alluded to one. Um, Herb would not, uh, and in fact did not say that he exactly invented the approach to conflict resolution with which he's most associated. Um, we call his variant of this approach the interactive problem solving workshop method. Um, that's what Donna was speaking about. But as Donna noted, he was building on the uh, initial work of the Australian diplomat and scholar John Burton. And Herb acknowledged this publicly and in his publications with great frequency. Uh, Burton was the first to bring together politically influential members of groups in conflict for unofficial dialogue. Um, and he called his approach controlled communication. Burton invited Herb to, to participate in one of his very early workshops, and that was a huge turning point in Herb's career. So um, when Herb sort of got into this conflict resolution uh, domain, he was innovating both on Burton's initial foundation and on his own, uh, Herb's own early work on social influence, which you just heard Dan talk about, and also the psychology of international relations generally. Another paradox as we think about Herb as an innovator is that uh, he was very cautious by nature. He was, uh, one might say, a rather unlikely innovator. He sometimes said about himself, others think big, I think small. Uh, in many ways, he was an incrementalist, not a radical transformer. He was very detail-oriented, even fastidious. Um, he was very aware of others' vulnerabilities and, sen and sensitivities, no doubt, because he had felt so vulnerable at one point in his life. Um, so he always took great care to make people feel secure, uh, to make them feel like they were still inside the envelope, even as he was pushing the edges of the envelope. Um, let me also say something about the context in which uh, Herb began his work, because I think it's really essential to understanding him as an innovator. He began his professional career in the aftermath of World War II, as Donna mentioned, um, his career flourished at the height of the Cold War. And during this time, uh, scholars in numerous disciplines were, were focused on how to avoid a third world war and nuclear annihilation. Uh, people working inside political science, international relations, economics, and other disciplines. And many of these scholars, as Donna uh, sort of noted, and certainly the most influential among them had a realist orientation. They were focused on power politics. Um, and much of the work by scholars who weren't realists, uh, those advocating what's called the liberal view or liberalism within international relations, their work was highly quantitative and often based in game theory. Um, it, among both of these camps, the liberals and the realists, um, their primary level of analysis was institutions. The realists were focused on nation states, the, uh, the, the, those of a liberal orientation were focused on other sorts of institutions like treaty regimes and international organizations and markets. Um, and uh, all of them, as Donna noted, were primarily also focused on material factors like control of territory. Um, and natural resources or capital flows, things like that. Um, one final note on the context in which Herb begins to innovate um, and focus particularly on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I think it's really important to know that um, informal unofficial contact among members of the two groups was strictly forbidden in the early days of Herb's work. Um, in fact, uh, I, I believe I recall him telling me at one point that it was even a capital offense or something near that in one or both communities at the time. Um, in those days, antagonistic governments tried to basically maintain a monopoly on interaction among citizens that had any kind of diplomatic purpose. Um, so with all that as background, how was Herb an innovator? 
Well, I think the first point, um, that first and foremost, is that he he innovated simply by deftly ad agitating against everything I just described. Um, he was a rigorous social scientist, uh, yet his work was just humanistic through through and through, and focused on its you know shall we say soft factors. Um, as Dan just described, his theory of social change was focused on the individual and individual perspective change in social context, of course. Um, but he was focused on individuals as the, the most concrete, least abstract uh, unit of analysis for understanding collective behavior. Uh, and he understood that much of our collective behavior is about satisfying individual needs. Um, he was also focused not just on our material needs, but as Donna said, also our immaterial, our psychological needs, fears and concerns. And he understood that these were connected to these material factors that other people were looking at. Um, another way in which Herb ad innovated generally was, uh, you know, he had a background as an activist in the civil rights movement. Um, and so he was not content to operate solely in the domain of theory as, as most academics were doing. He felt compelled to intervene. Uh, and, and so again, inspired by Burton, he developed and employed the scholar practitioner model of being in the academy to which many of us in the field are heirs today. Um, and a final sort of general innovation, if you will, was, um, or part of his, his burden <laughs> innovating in the way he did, I would say, is that he was ever vigilant about maintaining credibility within the academy with um, colleagues, governments, and individual participants in his workshops. Um, it, what he was doing was sort of out of the box. And, uh, and, and so this incremental, deliberate, detailed-oriented approach that came so naturally to him was very important. Um, I would say that he innovated by uh, doing non-mainstream things uh, and then theorizing about them and framing them in a way that made them seem and in fact become mainstream. Um, so let me just cite a few specific innovations uh, early on in his career with these problem-solving workshops and then note a couple later innovations in problem-solving workshops. Um, among the early innovations were working with political influentials, as Donna mentioned, um, but political influentials who were not current officials. Um, her belief that people who weren't currently in office had, uh, were less constrained. To, to engage in creative dialogue. Um, but this presented a problem of what we call transfer in the field. How do you get what comes out of those dialogues into the policy domain? Um, we, I won't go into that, but let me just say he took this theoretical and practical issue and uh, it, it treated it as another opportunity for innovation. Um, and he and several of his colleagues, people like Ron Fisher and some of his graduate students, people like the late Cynthia Chataway made really important contributions on this notion of transfer of track two into track one or official negotiation. Another early innovation was that uh, he really believed that um, third party team facilitation teams um, it had to be what he called multi-partial. And he, he articulated this idea really early. Um, this is the idea that uh, basically the facilitation teams had to be diverse in the ways the participants in the workshops themselves were diverse. Um, so he worked, he was Jewish, he worked with Palestinians, he was male, he worked with women. Um, and uh, in the early days of the field, there was much talk about the ideas of neutrality and impartiality. Um, and we now regard those concepts as fictions, basically, in the field. And, and I think it's really significant to note that Herb never bought into them. Um, a final, there are many others I could mention, but a final uh, innovation I'd mentioned, uh, Dan alluded to it, was his, his focus on uh, our need to establish positive personal and social identity. Um, and his framing of, of many types of, many of the conflicts we see in the world is, is being pursued mainly as sort of zero sum efforts to establish secure identities. 
Um, and as Dan said, he saw these problem solving workshops as a, a context in which parties could engage in a process of negotiating identity, um, eliminating the neg negation of others uh, and claims of exclusivity for one's own identity, while still honoring, as Dan said, the uh, you know our, our the core of our identities and uh, the values associated with them. Let me just mention a couple later. Herb continued to innovate throughout his career. Um, and a couple later innovations in the problem-solving workshop approach were um, the idea of continuing workshops. Uh, before uh, this later part of his career, let's say beginning in the 1990s, um, all the workshops more or less had been sort of one-shot weekend affairs. Um, and uh, he, he later established something called the Joint Working Group on Israeli-Palestinian Relations, which was co-chaired with Nadim Ruhana. It had 15 meetings of the same participants post-Oslo. Um, focused on final status issues, um, and and that's a that's a an innovation that's being practiced by people who were mentored uh, by Herb to this day. The idea of ongoing workshops. Um, also, he um, in that context and others, he he became focused on producing. Uh, concrete outputs, or what he called joint products of workshops, um, the uh, the the ongoing Israeli-Palestinian group that I mentioned produced three working papers, um, and this um, this was it might that might not seem like a big deal, but Donna mentioned these norms of confidentiality and non-attribution. You can see how um, taking the step of producing concrete outputs that would get uh, transferred into the policy domain like this. Written documents would um, agitate against those, those norms. So these are just a couple data points that show how he continued to innovate throughout his career. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude by sharing a little personal anecdote. Um, Donna, uh, Donna mentioned this before uh, the webinar began uh, and uh, suggested I share it. Um, I loved how Dan really sort of asked and I think really appropriately answered uh, the question, what drove Herb? What was he really after deep, deep, um, you know, individual change is the answer. Um, and uh, uh, we heard Herb sort of say that and uh, say the same things in slightly different terms um, very near the end of his life. Donna and I were visiting at him about three weeks before he died. We each saw him after, but the last time I saw him, he was no longer able to communicate. Um, he was in bad shape when we saw him uh, during this visit three weeks before he died. His uh, breathing and speech were very labored. So we mainly just sort of sat at his bedside and held his hand. But um, as we were getting ready to, uh, to leave, I don't know what moved me, but I asked Herb the question, um, what do you want us to know? And, uh, and Herb said, he answered my question with another question. He said, what will it take to bring more people to love. And uh, I, I really think uh, that is a question that was at the heart of all of Herb's work. And that is, uh, that's what drove his efforts to innovate and to intervene. And uh, um, his, his legacy is, is in part inspiring a whole cadre of other people who are, um, pursuing that question in his footsteps in their own ways. Thank you. Jeff, Jeff and Dan, thank you so much. Could, could you both come uh, uh, put your um, uh, uh, videos on? Because I think, uh, yeah, there we go. Dan, is there anything you wanted to comment on from what Jeff said or? I, I'm just still so taken by those words, what Herb left us with. I know, I know. I mean, Jeff and I were sitting there and he could barely talk, right, Jeff? He could barely say a word. And he, he was, was kind of gasping as he said that almost, yeah. 
he was gasping and and all of a sudden he just came out with such clarity with that question for us you know what is it going to take to bring more people to love and jeff and i just looked at each other and it's like oh my gosh i can't believe what he just said and then he went fast asleep he went he went back you know out of consciousness and we were just we were just so um stunned by what he his message to him and and to, to us and jeff you know that was the last thing he said to us because when we saw him after that he wasn't able to speak he was unconscious so those were the last words and jeff and i both feel so strongly that this is the legacy and you know what what will it take to bring more people to love what will it take and um and i think all of us um, no who could who could disagree with that with that challenge figure it out what will it take so um and i and i you know, would like to pass that on to everyone you know, who is present here today to try to help us figure that out because it's the only answer you know i mean didn't john lennon say that how many years ago <laughs> um yeah so uh yeah dan and, and jeff uh thank you so much i just uh you know, I wanted to say one last thing about uh, to comment on what Jeff um, was saying about these workshops that one and someone in the someone in the Q&A asked, what do you admire most? And I thought the three of us can answer that. What was the quality you most admired in him? Well, you know, it was these workshops that uh, Herb conducted with Israelis and Palestinians. They were so, uh, so innovative, as Jeff pointed out, that people from all over the world wanted to come and observe these workshops. They wanted to say, let me see what's happening because the, you know, the effect that you're having is so powerful. And so Herb would say, no, can't have observers. We just cannot have observers. It, it's too disrespectful. We don't want people feeling like they, you know, they have to be careful what they're saying because there's all these observers. And also he wanted to respect their, you know, their pain and their suffering as well. And so what did he do? He decides that he's going to teach a class called the Social Psychological Dimensions of International Conflict. I co-taught that with him for years. And what we did was at the end of the class, the final event of the class was a weekend long actual problem solving workshop with Israelis and Palestinians who either were in the area or for whatever reason, you know, her brought them to Harvard to have these, um, have the workshop. But what he did was he, in the 13th floor of William James Hall, there was a, what do you call that, Dan? It's like a two-way mirror. Two-way mirror. All right, yeah. Yeah. Two -way mirror. Yeah. And he had the students sitting behind the two-way mirror and, and, and then two students would rotate at the table to be, become official members of the third party. So, you know, talk about innovation, Jeff. You know, it was, he had his, he had his principles. He did not want to violate their, um, you know, their confidentiality. He didn't want people observing and, you know, going out and who knows what he was afraid of, but he just really felt strongly. And there he did, he came up with this amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, uh, well, I was a student in that class, as you know, when you guys were, were teaching it. And that was my, you know, entry point, I suppose, into this work in the international context. Um, on the question of like what one quality or word, you know, would you choose? I mean, the quality, the, the, it's hard to choose. I think all the words I would choose roll up into the one word mensch. Um, but, uh, but, but I would probably just below that I'd put integrity there, you know, and I think that is why he could, he had the convening power he did. Um, he was, uh, you know, during the luncheon after his recent memorial, his longtime assistant Cassandra said, uh, um, you know, I opened his mail, answered his emails, answered the phone for years, and I can tell you this guy had nothing to hide. Um, he he was he was completely integrated, uh, you know, and uh, and and you met him and you knew that and you trusted him. I mean, you know, he was he was just ultimately 
there and present to people and 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 trustworthy. And I think that was a huge ingredient of his success and what he did. Dan, how about you? Is there a word that comes to mind? Uh, I, I think it's more a, a, probably a set of words, <laughs> not, okay. not too many sentences. Uh, no, I mean, as I was listening to both of you, I was thinking about the field of peacemaking, peace building, and how over the years it's gotten, you know, in some quarters, a bad rap. It's it's soft, it's insignificant, it's not hard and tough and real, and it's not going to make a big difference. And one of the things, in addition to everything you both have been talking about, uh, that I so appreciate is the academic rigor, and, and you both alluded to this, the academic rigor and the credibility that he brought to conceptions of conflict resolution, conflict, you know, all of this. Um, and it's just, it was, it's really rigorous. It's really well thought out. It's not just a loose theory, but it's a very tight theory with interwoven parts um, that to me brings that academic credibility and, and sort of frees a lot of us then to be able to do work in the real world and say, you know what, it's grounded. There's some empirical mm -hmm. grounding, some solid theoretical grounding. I always felt like he was just that source of grounding. He seemed to have ideas that came from, you know, just almost divine inspiration, um, the level of depth and wisdom that he brought. Um, and thank goodness for it all, you know, yeah. Yeah, thank goodness for it all is right. Um, let me just share a couple of um, questions and comments from the, from the audience, Dan and, and Jeff. Jane McCann said um, as a comment, I was in grad school in the late 70s, and we studied Herb's attitude research and a classic article about ethics with subjects in experiments. He used the term double deception. I assigned that article to students for years. Herb's ethical behavior was so ingrained in his personality. I think it's it sums it up. I mean, there, there, it, there wasn't... Um, there wasn't a moment, I think, that went by in his interactions with people, no matter who they were, where he didn't, you know, really deliberately consider the impact uh, of his actions on other people and how he was going to behave and how he would treat others. And, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to make it sound like he was this perfect human being. Of course, you know, he had he had his issues as well. At the same time, I think he worked so hard at remaining conscious of those ethical issues that Jane just pointed out. It was a constant, a constant grappling with him. And I know, you know, he had disagreements with people mm. about, you know, what to do or what, you know, reconciliation looked like or what it was, you know, what, um, what it would take to end the uh, conflict in the Middle East, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I mean, he had a lot of, um, deep discussions about it with, with people and, and some disagreements, as I said. So, but it was, I think the word integrity and the word ethical, um, he was, well, he was, the, wasn't his, um, Jeff and Dan, wasn't his, uh, uh, point, his uh, chair at the psychology department, the uh, professor of ethics and social change? Like his, his, he had the Cabot chair in Cabot social chair. ethics. In yeah. social ethics, which I thought was uh, it, both really interesting and uh, inappropriate. Yeah, he also was, uh, he cared a lot to Dan's point about academic integrity and the sort of development of the discipline of social psychology. And he was a, he was a real early vocal um, thinker contributor around uh, the ethics of how research is conducted. So, you know, he was, he, he was really big on the ethics of human subject research and, and uh, wrote a lot about that and contributed in that domain. So everywhere you turn, he's just focused on integrity. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna sort of shift the conversation a little. There are two people who wrote um, a similar thing. I'll read them both, both comments and questions. Herb Kelman most focused on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, yet that situation is anything, if anything is in the worst shape ever. Can the speakers identify anything they see, see as missing from his wonderful work? I know you cannot cover everything here, but perhaps there might be a follow-up uh, on critiquing his work. And Susan Coleman wrote, 
Hi all, I believe it is hard for Herb to see the constant setbacks. It was hard for Herb to see the constant setbacks in the Arab Israeli or Palestinian um, situation in spite of his efforts. What do you think he would say now that the current rise of authoritarianism and fascism around the globe, in spite of all the efforts of all of us in the conflict resolution field, so she's broadening this out from the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to the world, you know, uh, the fascism and authoritarianism in the world. But what were we missing, I guess, is what both parties, what both people are asking here. What were we missing and what was he missing? Oh, go ahead, Dan. Sounds like I have a thought, but yeah. Uh, feel free to start. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, he, he, um, the one thing I think he might say he missed early on, but his, uh, his views began to change on towards the end of his life. First of all, I think he was, he, he, he was a little despondent wouldn't be the right word. He never lost hope, but uh, he was realistic. You know, he used to describe himself as being a strategic optimist. You know, that optimism was a smart strategy to embrace, um, to, to get to needed change, but he wasn't, Pollyannish, and he didn't. Um, he he, re, he, you know, I think he realized what what the questioners have have said. But um, one thing I think he thinks was missing in his early writings and his work, um, he focused on what he called mainstream uh, people within each community. You know, um, he thought it was important for each community to know that there was a a mainstream that could be a you know a stable a uh, reliable negotiating partner. Um, and uh, a number of people in his orbit, including myself for some time were advocating that um, actually you need to begin including people who are, let's say out of the mainstream, like in the Israeli-Palestinian context, religious nationalists, the, the, the dovish members of the hawkish groups, let's, let's say. And, uh, he was initially sort of resistant to that idea, but um, the uh, a project uh, with the Kelman Institute, which is named in his in his honor, uh, based in Austria, um, brings together such diverse parties and has been going on for years. And he became very interested in that work and very supportive of the idea of sort of um, including. Maybe it's a segue to the next question, which I won't try to answer, but. Um, uh, her on authoritarianism, authoritarianism and whatnot, he'd find it both depressing and uh, he'd be curious about it. Um, he, he, he never pathologized anything. I remember naively in his international conflict resolution course, my first contribution was something really goofy. Like I raised my hand and said, I think war is pathological. And he, he uh, I got my first little uh, learning from Herb at that point. He said, no. You know, it may be a bad way to solve problems, but we need to understand why people are are doing it. Um, and so I think you'd say the same thing about many of the things that we look at in the world today and get kind of depressed about. Yeah, just uh, on that question, uh, in addition to what you were just saying, Jeff, I, I, I don't wanna be a, a, a blind defender of Herb's theory, but if one looks at his model of change, change happens at different speeds, different types of change. Compliance, we can do that very quickly. You can get the UN or a set of soldiers to separate different groups of people in the world, and that can happen with a bit of negotiation, but at rapid speed, how do you change attitudes? How do you change deeply ingrained assumptions about who I am in relation to somebody else? That's not a quick fix. You know, and so I don't know what Herb would say and how he'd respond, but my read of his work would suggest that we can move toward compliance, we can move towards some sort of, um, you know, identification, building those relationships, but the deeper work takes time. And like Jeff just said, I think beautifully, it takes an interdisciplinary multi-stakeholder group, it takes society as a whole to move through that transitional process. That's not you know, let's snap our finger and that's going to work. I think, you know, some would argue, in, 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 at least in some of my interactions with uh, colleagues in the region, that, you know, slowly at deeper levels, you're starting to see a transition. It's, but it's not, it doesn't take a day, it doesn't take a decade, it takes real time. 
Um, and, and I would just throw in one other thing that I loved about Herb was, in addition to his rigor, he was open to thinking about new ideas. And Donna, here I think about your incredible work with him and the introduction of dignity uh, more explicitly into his work as a, a, a just a testament to his own openness and an awareness that there's always space for new thinking, but I don't want to talk about dignity with you here because you are the scholar on that, that we're the expert. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Dan. Um, well, you know, I, I, I'm in answering the question um, about what was missing and, you know, that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is in worse shape now than it was even when he was uh, working actively there. You know, I, I, I'm, I think about Ron Heifetz. He was another very strong influencer for me and my thinking, especially around leadership. Ron is a professor at uh, the Kennedy School of Government, and he has, specializes in this leadership style called adaptive leadership. And one of the things that he um, always emphasized about change, especially internal organizational change, was you know you could you could craft the most beautiful um, program or intervention in order to uh, create change internally but never lose sight of the power of the external forces that are at play and working on, on uh, your efforts. And I think, you know, I think, you know, not to make excuses for her, but I think the external forces that have been at play, even to this very day in the Middle East, there's so much chaos, so much flux, so much turmoil, not only in the Middle East, but in the world in general. So I think um, until that those external forces become a little more stabilized, I'm not sure we're going to see any big rapid, you know, certainly not rapid to, to underscore Dan's point, but I think we can't, we can't be um, so too Pollyanna-ish about what we think we're capable of doing either. And, and I do believe that Herb understood that. I'm, 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 I'm sure he did. Um, and yet at the same time, like Jeff said, he wouldn't give up, you know, he never gave up even to the very last breath, you know, he's telling us, well, so, um, so I appreciate the, I appreciate the, the comments from the, from the audience about, you know, there are some, there are some things that he might have missed, or that, you know, we're just out of his control as well at the same time. All right, I'm gonna, I think we're about, let me see what time it is. Okay, we have a few more minutes. Um, uh, someone, uh, Vladenia Bataj Jan says, so what would it take to bring more people to love? And another woman said, courage, humility, faith, creativity. So I'm wondering, uh, the three of us, you know, what would we say? What would it take to end this conversation here? What would it take to bring more people to love? I'd say point the finger back toward oneself. <laughs> it's so easy in this world to blame, to criticize, oh, they, 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 they. Um, and to recognize that, you know, the 131 of us here, what's one thing you can do today and tomorrow and this week and next week to try to live that vision that Herb dedicated his life to? That's yeah. great. Now, I don't think I can improve much on those two points. I would just add that I think Herb, uh, I, I can really see and feel him right now. Uh, he was just so wonderfully proud and adoring of, of, of the people he mentored. And, you know, he did a lot of informal mentoring too, of people who weren't his students or postdocs, but, you know, just others in the field. He was just very generous with his time and energy. And he was, uh, he was quite delighted by the things people were doing that were different from his work. I mean, he was very delighted by and proud of your dignity work, Donna, you know, and he told me that several times. Um, and and uh, so I think uh, one answer to the to Herb's question would be, you know, do what you're doing, you know, <laughs> just <laughs> lean in, uh, the world needs you, you know, um, bring yourself to love and do what moves you. And uh, and that will help bring more people to love. 
Well, you know, the um, Arab root of the word dignity is generosity. Mm -hmm. And I just really believe that um, we have to be more generous with everything. Uh, and that, well, it's a whole long story about what that relates to in, 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 uh, in terms of uh, dignity. But I, I really think Herb was one of the most generous of his time, of his efforts, of his everything. Um, and I think that would help if we could just be more generous. And like Dan said, start with ourselves. Who, who do we want to be more generous with? What can we do? How can we make their lives easier? How can we help people in these very, very difficult trying times to restore their dignity, to restore peace in their soul? So we, we can give more. I think we can. All right, James Kerwin, last but not least, he's going to close it out for us from the program on negotiation. Hi, I'm James Kerwin, the Assistant Director from Program on Negotiation here at Harvard Law School. And want to thank Donna, Jeff, and Dan for sharing your insights into Herb's work today. Uh, you know, you all three spoke at the memorial for Herb a few weeks ago, and it was just a beautiful service. And, you know, you had so much generosity yourselves in thinking back on his work and his ongoing leg uh, legacy. So really thrilled that we're able to share this online uh, today with our audience. I uh, also want to let you know about a few, our audience know about a few things coming up at the program on negotiation. Uh, we're having Dan Shapiro teach a one day course for us in November on leveraging the powers of emotions as you negotiate. And also we have uh, a new course coming up in January that we're teaching online virtually. So we're excited about that. But I really want to thank our audience today for joining us in this tribute and invite them to share uh, this video that we'll put up in, in, a, in about a week uh, of today's talk. So share these insights uh, with others to motivate even more people to do Herb's work. Um, but I uh, want to just close this session. I think the uh, best way to close this session is by using Herb's words uh, and asking his question. Uh, what will it take to bring more people to love? Thank you all for joining us today.